A senior detective on the notorious Essex Boys triple murder case is alleged to have had a romantic relationship with one of the victim's girlfriends, a probe reveals. The improper relationship between Detective Inspector George Florence and Donna Jaggers, the former partner of murder victim Craig Rolfe, was not disclosed at the trial of Michael Steele and Jack Wilmes. The pair were convicted of the murders of drug dealers Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe in 1998, but have always insisted they are innocent. The failure to disclose the relationship between D.I. Florence, the deputy senior investigating officer in the murder hunt, poses questions as Miss Jaggers went on to become a prosecution witness, say a team of former Scotland Yard murder detectives. They have independently reviewed the original investigation over four years before compiling a 132-page dossier now handed to the CCRC, the Criminal Case Review Commission, by Wombs and Steele's lawyers. The ex-Met detectives working for private investigation firm TMI have called on Essex Police to release previously undisclosed material about corruption probes into the late DI Florence to pass on to the CCRC, which can only refer cases to the Court of Appeal. Tate, Tucker and Rolf were found shot dead in a Range Rover on an isolated farm track in Retterdon by two farmers at 8am on December 7th 1995. The prosecution case centred largely on the evidence of Supergrass Darren Nichols, who claimed to be the getaway driver, supported by Miss Jagger's evidence, after his arrest over a cannabis importation in May 1996. TMI boss David McKelvey, a former Met Police DCI, said, there were suspicions around Florence and Miss Jaggers being romantically involved ahead of the trial, but this was never officially disclosed. If this was the case, he should have not been allowed to be involved with her as a witness. The defence should have had all the information and have been able to cross-examine witnesses about this. Essex Police must now disclose everything it has about this and this corruption investigation into D.I. Florence, so it is available to the new CCRC review. The TMI report states its private detectives spoke with two former Essex police officers who confirmed the affair allegations. One also said that around the time of the trial, the force mounted a covert corruption probe into the past activities of D.I. Florence. In relation to high-value stolen cars and a possible connection to Pat Tate through the South Essex car trade. He also collected a loaded Mac-10 machine gun she had been in possession of just over a month after the murders, without arresting her or taking a statement from her for nearly a month. On February the 8th, 1996, she gave her first witness statement, which admitted to knowing that Rolf had got the gun in November 1995, and she kept it in the loft after the murders, until Mr Florence came to collect it on January the 11th. Mrs Jaggers was never charged in connection with the firearm. She went on to become a key prosecution witness, which implicated stealing the murders, and picked him out in an identification parade. Mr McKelvey said, Florence made some startling decisions not to prosecute her, despite her admissions to having a loaded machine gun, ammunition, and involved in wide-scale drug dealing. Nor did Essex Police ever disclose any details of corruption investigation into Florence, and the CPS claimed in a letter dated 16th of September 1997 that this was an unrelated matter. Any allegation of dishonesty by a senior officer so intrinsically involved in the resident murders investigation cannot simply be ignored and dismissed. Florence knew Tate and was the conduct to Donna Jaggers being a prosecution witness. In a case where the defence was alleging manipulation of evidence by Nichols, then such material should have been disclosed. Jaggers was placed into the witness protection after the trial and it has not been possible to approach her for comment. D.I. Florence resigned from the force as soon as he was notified about the investigation and it is not known if it was concluded. But the probe is understood to have caused at least one other trial to collapse. In a separate twist, the report claims that Essex police placed a bug in the flat of Sarah Saunders and a new boyfriend during a botched undercover sting operation. Miss Saunders had left Tate before he was killed and was living in the home of a new partner near Brentwood at the time in February 1996. Operation Sentry was an undercover job which the force got two Royal Ulster Constabulary Special Branch officers to try and infiltrate Steele by posing as violent paramilitary criminals claiming to have been involved in a drug deal with Tate prior to the murders, who he owed £40,000 to. Some details of Sentry were disclosed to the trial, but Mr McKelvey claims much of the details was not. 
He said, The intention was to persuade Steele that Tate had been engaged in a drug deal with them, in the hope that Steele would disclose vital evidence, or implicate himself in the murders. But he never did. There was at least four telephone calls from the undercover officers to Steele on his landline, on February the 5th, the 9th, the 12th, and the 26th, 1996. Sarah Saunders was also called by them and threatened on February the 26th, despite the recent death of Tate, who was father to their young son. Mr McKelvey said, A former Essex officer contacted us in June 2022 to say that there was a covert entry of the flat to deploy a listening probe. It is remarkable that this was done to someone who was the partner of one of the murder victims. Essex police never disclosed the covert entry, the deployment of the covert listening device or any material from that device to the defence. We formally requested disclosure of the probe material from Essex police, but it replied that it would never confirm or deny the use of covert policing tactics. The recording of the first call to Steele was not disclosed at trial, with the prosecution saying the recorder malfunctioned, but Mr McKelvey said another former Essex officer involved in Sentry made contact and claimed that the officer who made the call was drunk at the time and went too far with the threats, so it was destroyed. After securing no criminating evidence, Sentry was cancelled. Mr McKelvey said it was a major significance that during Nichols' first two interviews after he agreed to give evidence, officers made reference to the Mullock brothers and a drugs debt that he was convinced was a reference to two fictional characters the Northern Irish officers portrayed. He said, they were never mentioned again, which suggests manipulation of evidence and the interviewing officers had not been properly briefed about the end of century. The report said that Steele had recorded one of the phone calls, including the one never disclosed by the prosecution, and kept them with a compromising photograph of him meeting with a police officer. Added that Mrs Saunders had disclosed the fact that Steele held his recordings to an officer on the murder probe she was close to. Steele's home was searched by Essex Police on May 14th, 1996, and the recordings went missing. A CCR spokesman said, Applications have been received from Mr Steele and Mr Wombs, and a review is underway. An Essex Police spokesman said, There has been an exhaustive police investigation into the murders, which resulted in the convictions. Since then, the case has been back before the Court of Appeal. These appeals have included focus upon key residential aspects of the case. This case has been reviewed by the CCRC, who as recently as January of 2023 took the decision not to refer the case back to the Court of Appeal. This case has been exhaustively examined over the last 27 years. We will, of course, always work with the CCRC and keep any new information under review. Wombs and Steele immediately tried to appeal their convictions, but in 1999, leave to go to the Court of Appeal was rejected. The CCRC then looked at the case and its first review led to it being referred back to the Court of Appeal, which rejected the appeal in 2006. In 2007 and then late 2014, the CCRC examined the case again, but there was no referrals to the court. The last CCRC review, which began in 2018, concerned a secret police recording of a London crime boss who told a suspected corrupt former Met Police detective who could get the free killed because of their involvement in supplying the ecstasy tablet that killed Leah Betts 21 days before the murders. The conversation was recorded on the day Leah died during a Scotland Yard bugging operation of the crime boss and detailed in a 2002 Met anti-corruption report, but details had never been disclosed to Worms and Steele's defence. The CCRC review closed in 2023 without a referral to the court.